Hi again. We're going to move on from the red blood cells and start talking about white blood cells and alterations in leukocyte or white blood cell function. We'll talk about mononucleosis and leukemias. So disorders of the white blood cells. Leukocytes are key players in the inflammatory response and fighting infection. Inflammation infection. That's important to know. Leukocyte function, which is their infection fighting ability, is affected if too many or too few white cells are present in the blood or if the cells that are present are structurally or functionally de defective. They're just, they're, they're, they're made, but they're just not made properly. Normal range for white blood cells is about 4,000 to 10,000 millimeters cubed, depending on which lab you're using. So you should have a basic understanding of that. Remember the leukocytes are divided into function and um, structure. So when they're divided into structure, there are granulocytes that have granulars on them and agranulocytes. The agranulocytes being the lymphocytes and the monocytes, the granulocytes being the other ones, the basophils, neutrophils, the eosinophils, and they have granules on them. The agranular are the lymphocytes and the monocytes. Remember that lymphocytes have the T cell and the B cell and the natural killer cells. So they do have a little different function in regards to immunity than, than these ones over here. So let's talk about leukocytosis. So leukocytosis is white blood cell increase, okay, leukocytosis, is present when the count is higher than normal. So white blood cells are greater than 10,000. Important to know. Leukocytosis occurs in a normal protective response to physiologic stressors. So when a patient does have inflammation, does have infection, leukocytes are going to go high. They're going to be high and they can be, they're, they're a normal protective response to such stressors like invading microorganisms, strenuous exercise, it's just stress, stress related to emotional change, temperature changes, anesthesia, surgery, pregnancy, stress on the body, toxins, drugs, hormones, medications that are put in the body. This is also caused by pathologic conditions such as malignancies and hematologic disorders. So when somebody does have leukocytosis, again, it's generally in response to infection or inflammation or stress. Um, but if it tends to be chronic, we have to know that there are some other reasons that they may be increased. So this little cell right here, um, just this little is a breakdown of the white blood cells. So remember the differential, a white blood count with a differential. And when we get a differential, we get one, two, three, four, five different uh, white blood cells. The neutrophils being the first one, the most plentiful, they are the first to arrive to the scene of uh, inflammation or infection. They have the 54 to 62% of white blood cells are neutrophils, so they're the most abundant. And what do increased levels indicate? Well, generally it in indicates just what we said, infection, stress, inflammation, you can put there too. That's what neutrophils um, gen generally come. It, it's an indication there's a, a bacterial infection. What about lymphocytes? Lymphocytes are the next most abundant. And remember I talked about it as in regard to abundance, Never let monkeys eat bananas. This is the most abundant down to the least abundant. About 25 to 33%, you don't need to know this column, column right here. But what do lymphocytes, elevated lymphocytes indicate? Well, they generally indicate this right here, a viral infection. So neutrophils, bacterial, lymphocytes, viral infections, and mononucleosis being a viral infection that we'll talk about. The next one is monocytes, and they're about 3 to 9% of the white blood cell. And generally, monocytes increase with certain types of, of fungal infections. So just any type of a, uh, a tuberculosis, a bacteria, you know, malaria is a, um, by, uh, like a parasite. But fungal infection in general, monocytes increase. Eosinophils, this one's important. They increase in allergic reactions, patients who have asthma, allergies, sometimes they are not maintained by their medications, 
and we find out they have really high eosinophils and there's medications that we can give them to suppress those eosinophils and allergy symptoms go away. So eosinophil would be allergy. And a basophil, they're the smallest amount in, in regard to abundancy. They're less than 1% of white blood cells. And this chart here says cancers, they can increase in cancers, different viruses, hypothyroidism. But basophils increase, if you want to add here, parasites. So like parasites, fungus, cancer, but, but mostly just put parasites here because that's actually originally, I mean, if you just ha can remember one thing for each one of them, which is not a bad idea, um, I would put parasites by that. Leukopenia is present when the count, the white blood cell count is lower than normal. White blood cell Leukopenia, little, small. Unlike leukocytosis, leukopenia is never normal. Remember, we just said that leukocytosis is a normal response to an invader or inflammation. And it's defined as an absolute blood cell count less than 4,000. So white blood cells being less than 4,000. Leukopenia is associated with a decrease in neutrophils, obviously, because they're the most abundant of the white blood cells which increases the risk of infection. As these neutrophils decrease, the risk of infection increases. The absolute neutrophil count, which is abbreviated ANC, is calculated by multiplying white blood cell count by the percent of band and segmented neutrophils. So band, when we talk about bands, they're just little teeny baby neutrophils that get left out uh, of, the, of the bone marrow too soon. And so there can be an indication of um, increased bands, which we'll talk about in a second, which could be significant. So, and segments is same thing. These are just little neutrophils that are immature that get let out too soon. So you don't have to memorize this, this formula or anything. It's just kind of helpful to know that it is a multiplication of the white blood cell count and the little babies that have been released. A normal neutrophil count is 1,500 to 8,000 cells. Okay, so we're talking about leukopenia in regard to all the white blood cells, the general, the main white blood cell count being low. But um, neutrophils can also be low. And so when they may, if their neutrophils are low, it's called neutropenia. And this absolute neutrophil count is something that we take a look at. And there's classifications. We can have mild neutropenia, a moderate neutropenia, or severe neutropenia. We know that the normal is 1,500 to 8,000. A mild neutropenia is um, about 1,000 to 1,500, so just a little bit of a neutropenia, but they still are neutropenic. Moderate is 500 to 1,000, and severe neutropenia is less than 500. So this is, becomes very significant. When the ANC is less than 500, the possibility for life-threatening infections is high. They are obviously more prone to infections. It's hard for their body to fight anything. They don't have any neutrophils because they can't fight any pathogens off. Leukopenia may be caused by radiation. Okay. So definitely somebody, and I have chemo down here, but chemo and radiation, this is not uncommon in a patient who has cancer and they're getting treatment for their cancer. And then cancer kills the, or excuse me, the chemo and the radiation kill the cancer cells, but they also kill good cells. So they're killing these white blood cells and they just become so immunosuppressed. Anaphylactic shock, autoimmune disease like SLE, immune deficiencies, certain drugs, somebody who's taking corticosteroids, we could see some neutropenia in them. And then, like I said, chemo agents. So when there's cancer patients that are getting chemo and radiation and they are neutropenic, you know, they're, they're less than 500, generally they get prescribed an antibiotic because they need something to help fight infection. Their chemo has to be held or the radiation has to be held. You can't give them to them because it's just like they just barely have any neutrophils left. So a shift to the left is a, the definition of this is when the demand for circulating mature, mature neutrophils exceeds the supply. So the body needs neutrophils, needs neutrophils, and the supply is not enough. These little immature neutrophils like the bands and the segs they're released from the bone marrow prematurely. So they come early and they release as little teeny baby immature cells. So typically when you hear that the term, there's a shift to the left in regard to the white blood cells. Um, 
it's just kind of this picture right here. And this bottom part right here is here's the little neutrophil. And this is increasing in maturity. And then they become mature down here. And when this is the what is picked up in the blood specimen, these mature white blood cells, that is what's normal. But when they do the, the A and C, they check the, the, the white blood cells and they are start to see some immature, some little baby bands and little baby sags in the blood, that is a shift to the left. And then when there's a, an abundance of little baby, they're just being released from the bone marrow just so prematurely, so prematurely because the demand exceeds the supply, we have a severe shift to the left. And basically the shift to the left just means that there are little immature neutrophils that are in the blood that we're, that, that, that we're measuring. Diagnosis, well, a neutrophil level and bone marrow biopsy, um, obviously it's just getting some blood and taking a look at the neutrophils. And again, these people often have to be treated with an antibiotic. So let's talk about lymphocytes, another type of white blood cell, a type one white blood cell that is distinguished from the rest by a lack of granules. So they are agranulocytes and they have a key role in the immune system as they are able to respond to unknown agents like any kind of antigens, foreigners, viruses, bacteria, cancer. So they respond when these um, foreigners or uh, antigens uh, invade our body. So there's two main lymphocytes. If you remember, we have here um, the lymphocyte breaks down and there's the helper T cells and we have the killer T cells. So there's B cells which make antibodies and killer T cells. So these are the lymphocytes right here, the B cells and the T cells. The T cells attack and kill and the B cells make antibodies and they both have the ability to have memory. So that's why when you get certain infections, like you get an infection, oh, for example, a measles or a chicken pox, you don't get it more than once because these, these lymphocytes have the ability to memorize that bacteria. And when it invades the body, there's already an antibody that is ready to kill it. And again, that's just how vaccines work as well. And these lymphocytes are found in the blood, obviously, they're white blood cells, and they are found in the lymphatic system. Okay, lymphocytosis, lymphocytopenia, same thing. Remember, cytosis, increased lymphocytes, decreased lymphocytes. An increase in the number of portion of lymphocytes in the blood. It is rare in acute bacterial infection as in seen mostly in acute viral infections. Remember that the lymphocytes increase typically to a viral infection, particularly those caused by the Epstein-Barr virus, which is a causative agent of infectious mononucleosis, which we'll talk about in a minute. The other side here is lymphocytopenia, which is a decrease in uh, lymphocytes. And it may be attributed to Maybe the, uh, there's an abnormality of lymphocyte production. They're not, lymphocytes aren't being produced. Maybe they're being destroyed by drugs, viruses, radiation, or multiple other things. It's also known to occur without any detectable cause. Okay, and this is a lymphocyte, has the antibodies, the foreigner comes in, and it either attacks and kills it if it's a T cell, or if it's a B cell like this one right here, it makes antibodies to kill that antigen right there. <clears throat> okay, let's talk a little bit about infectious mononucleosis. It's a benign, acute, self-limiting, lymphoproliferative. Lymphoproliferative meaning that the lymphs proliferate and proliferate, proliferate and multiply. Clinical syndrome characterized by acute viral infection of the B lymphocytes, okay? So mononucleosis is an infection of the lymphocytes. Most prevalent in adolescents and young adults caused by the Epstein-Barr virus, which is in the herpes family, and more than 90% of adults have an antibody to Epstein-Barr. We have, we have, we've already have produced the antibody to, body to fight Epstein-Barr. One thing about Epstein-Barr virus and when it does activate and cause somebody to have mononucleosis, it's a really long incubation period. I mean, this is like two to three months. So often the person can't really recall 
being around somebody who was sick or, or just kind of has a hard, difficult time kind of associating it. What are some manifestations? They get flu-like symptoms, or maybe they're asymptomatic. Um, classic symptoms for um, mononucleosis is fever, a sore throat, so the virus, the Epstein-Barr virus is ingested through the mouth. You may have heard it's called the kissing disease, only not because, you know, you can get it by kissing because it, it, it is transferred that way, but it comes through the mouth and then it just sits on the oral pharynx in the back of the throat. So classic, they have fever because the virus and the viruses in the body is sore throat. Their, so, their throat gets kind of thick, covered with some exudate. It looks like they have some white exudate in the back of their, their throat. The B cells, remember, they proliferate and proliferate, and they get bigger and bigger and multiply and multiply. And so they get cervical lymph node enlargement and fatigue. So these are classic symptoms that go along with infectious mononucleosis. So lymphadenopathies, because of this, this multiplication of the, the B cells, inflammation of the spleen, inflammation of the liver, inflammation of the lining of the lung, inflammation of the meninges. So it can cause an inflammation process in, in any organs or no, no organs, but know the classic signs of infection, infectious mononucleosis. How do we evaluate and treat it? Well, it's pretty easy to evaluate. There is a PCR. We can use a monostat, monospot test that they do like in urgent cares, and um, that can diagnose it pretty quickly. And again, it's usually self-limiting. You don't have to give antibiotics or give anything, and medical intervention is rarely required. Treatment is supportive, and it consists of rest and alleviating symptoms, some analgesics, some antipyretics. It treats the symptoms. They're very fatigued. They're fatigued for weeks and weeks and months. They need to rest. Keep in mind that aspirin is avoided with children because it could be associated with Rye syndrome. So that's something that we wouldn't want to give a child for any type of a virus. Okay, so now we're going to move into leukemia. And there's, I think, about five slides for leukemia. Um, so let's just start talking here. Leukemia is a clonal malignant disorder of the bone marrow and or the blood. So clonal meaning these are cells that are gen genetically identical. And so these stem cells, they make that make cells and they make these cells with the same genetic mutation. They keep making the same one over and over and over. And it's malignant. It's a malignancy. It's a cancer. So it's uncontrolled proliferation of malignant leukocytes causing an overcrowded in the bone marrow and decreasing the production of normal cells. So here's the normal blood. You can see the white blood cells, the platelets, the red blood cells in here. There's an abundance of red blood cells because they're the most. If you remember the centrifuge with the with when we saw the different blood components, red blood cells is much more red blood cells than white and platelets in the blood. And this one right here is somebody's blood screen with leukemia. And you can see these leukemia cells, these proliferated cells that just keep genetically multiplying and they are cells that have the same genetic mutation and they, they keep over producing and they crowd the bone marrow up right here and so there's a decrease in all the other the good cells because the, the leukemia cells are here without treatment disease progression results in a short survival time we do have some really great treatments for it is something that has to be diagnosed early. There's four general types of leukemia, and your book talks about more than these, but these are the four main types that you should know about. And if you kind of take a look at their names here, and I'll kind of go into a little bit more detail coming up, but they're grouped into acute and chronic. So two of them are acute, two of them are chronic, two of them are lymphocytic, and two of them are myeloids, okay? So let's kind of break that down further. And you can see that they're grouped by how quickly the disease develops, okay, two are acute, two are chronic, and by the type of blood cell that is affected. Is it a lymphocyte that is affected or a myelocyte that is affected, okay? So we have a myeloid stem cell here, and this stem cell can turn into whatever it's programmed to turn into. 
myeloid cells turn into red blood cells, they turn into platelets, and they turn into myoblasts, which turn into the granulocytes, the eosinophils, the basophils, and the neutrophils. So this turns into all three of these different types of cells, red platelets and the granulocytes. This one, uh, when it starts to um, mutate or, or starts to develop, um, it turns into a lymphoid stem cell. So this is the myeloid stem cell that can turn into these. This is the lymphoid stem cell that turns into a T lymphocyte or a B lymphocyte. So it goes into a lymphoid stem cell, into a baby lymphoblast, meaning a baby lymph. And then the lymphoblast turns into B, T, or a natural killer. So you can see that there's a difference that this stem cell can either be a myeloid or a lymph lymphoid. Hence, depending on which one of these cells is affected, depends on whether it is a lymphocytic or a myeloid leukemia, okay? So the four types of leukemia I wanna talk about. So we just talked about two being acute, two being chronic, two being lymphoblastic, lymphoblastic, myelogenous, which is the myeloid, it's just another name for it, myelogenous, myelogenous. So that's how they're categorized and that's important for you to know. So this first one right here, acute lymph lymphoblastic leuke leukemia, which is abbreviated, write it down, ALL, -L, okay? That's how they're referred to. ALL -L is obviously found in lymphoid cells, it's lymphoblastic, it grows quickly, it's acute, and ALL -L is actually the most common one in children. Keep in mind children's leukemia remains rare, but when a child has leukemia, this is the most common one that is seen in a child. Um, adults can have this one as well, uh, but uh, so this can be seen in adults or children, but if a child's gonna have it, this is the one. And this is just the, the, um, the blood cells, what they look like. The second acute one, okay, acute, in the myeloid, the myelogenous leukemia, is found in myeloid cells. Okay, we know that by the name. It grows quickly. We know that by the name. And it is most common in adults, even though it can be found in children. Generally, children, we're not looking at little ones here. Usually here, this is about two to eight years old. This would be teenagers and more kind of young adults. Could be in any age adult, but that's where it generally is seen right here, okay? So those are the acute, they grow quickly, prognosis um, becomes, can be poor because it, this, this is a cancer that grows so quickly where the prognosis of chronics are a little bit better. So let's move over to the chronic leukemias. So ALL, AML, CLL, chronic lymphoblastic leukemia found in the lymphoid cells and grows slowly. It's chronic. This is common in adults, generally greater than 55 years old and rare in children. These, 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 um, these chronic ones are generally found in older adults. The last one, CML, chronic myelogenous leukemia found in myeloid cells, hence the name, grows slowly. It's chronic. It's most common in adults. And now this is even an older adult, generally over 65 years old, where we see this. But again, it can happen in any one, uh, any adult. So just kind of a, kind of something that's helpful to know is acute, the prognosis for the two acute leukemias are only about 20 to 30 percent. So these prognoses at the five-year survival rate, maybe 20 to 30 percent. But I will say that the medications and the treatments have advanced very much. And so that that's improving. As far as a prognosis for the chronic leukemias, a survival rate greater than 10 years 
is about 70%. So this is slow growing. So their prognosis is better. This is quick growing. So their prognosis is unfortunately poorer. What are some clinical manifestations? Within days to a few weeks of the first symptoms is an abrupt stormy onset, which is more prevalent in the acute leukemias where the chronics, it's just a smoldering type of progression. The clinical manifestations of all varieties of leukemia are very similar, generally similar. similar. There's some main ones that you have to know. So pancytopenia, we talked about why they would have pancytopenia, right? Because all those leukemia, cell, leukemia cells are just overcrowding in the bone marrow. They have B symptoms. B symptoms are most commonly seen in lymphoma, but people with leukemia also can. And it's just something that we always want to ask patients when we're doing our histories. Do you have specific symptoms, which is fatigue, generally we're talking about extreme fatigue, weight loss, night sweats, fever. Fatigue, fever, weight loss, night sweats. Okay, those are important to know. We always ask people that. Fever, weight loss, night sweats, the, the main ones with fatigue. A Philadelphia chromosome, which is a chromosome that's found in all the different leukemias, but most prevalent in CML. Over 95% of people who have CML, when they check their blood for this Philadelphia chromosome, it is positive. So there are some chromosomes that are specific, the Philadelphia chromosome being most specific to CML, but again, it can be in all of them. So we talked about the fatigue, the fever, the night sweats, the unexplained weight loss, okay? There's the B symptoms right there. Frequent or severe nosebleeds. Why would they have nosebleeds? Excessive or easy bruising. Platelets are down. They have thrombocytopenia. They have pancytopenia, which includes thrombocytopenia. Bone pain and tenderness. The bone pain is because there's just that infiltration of leukemia cells inside their bone, and it, it just hollows it out and gives them bone pain. Enlarged liver, enlarged spleen, then and, and the lymph nodes are enlarged um, because just the leukemia cells have infiltrated the liver, the spleen, and the lymph nodes. Frequent or severe infections, they have neutropenia, they have low white blood cell count, so they get they get infections. Again, this swollen lymph node kind of goes with this large liver and spleen right here because of the invasion of the leukemia cells. So these are important to understand because these are questions that you ask your patients who come in and you want to know if they have any of these symptoms um, when, you're, when you're working up some diagnoses. So evaluation and treatment. Diagnosis is made through examination of the blood cells in the bone marrow. And these are just, this is just a picture from your book. And it's just the, moral, uh, the morphologic aspect of the different types of leukemia cells, ALL, AML, CLL, CML. You're not going to need to recognize this. I'm just kind of showing you what it looks like. It's critical to obtain an accurate diagnosis because of the differences in treatment and obviously prognoses, right? Chemotherapy used in various combinations is generally the treatment of choice for leukemia because you can't really radiate the blood. So radiation is for a specific spot. So chemotherapy in general is what these patients will have as treatment. Okay. Thank you.